Kevin Henning. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Right, so we're going to keep things like super simple. I had a really long, I had a really long title for this talk, and then eventually I didn't. Um, so it's the first talk I've done that is a number, um, and uh, and so therefore that means in a number of scripting languages this will uh, map to an empty string. Um, and 1968, 1968 is a very interesting year for multiple reasons. Um, it was a year in which we like to express the future using a variety of fonts, um, none of which were actually really invented in the 1960s. Uh, this is uh, Gil Sons, which is a 1928 monotype font. Uh, we were very fond of using Futura, which is a 1927 font, and Helvetica, which is a 1957 font. Um, all of these fonts will appear in this talk. And these typefaces, all this typeface design. Now, obviously, I have a very hard job because I'm the first slot after lunch. At this point, you're kind of going into a carb stupor. So, hey, 1968, flower power. All right, OK, a little bit of, little bit of color there to get you going. So we're going to focus on 1968, but somehow I need to take you back to 1968. We need a time machine. Conveniently enough, we do have a time machine. Um, software failure often gives us some surprises. We just heard that I'm quite interested in software failures. It turns out that using Facebook, I am able to transport myself back to the 1960s. As we can see there, I mean, for some reason, I have no idea why I decided to submit a, uh, a, a sort of report to uh, Facebook saying, hey, this bit doesn't work. Um, you know, you could improve this. Still hasn't happened. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, your, fa your feedback will be used to improve Facebook. Uh-huh. Thanks for taking the time all the way back to 1969. Um, clearly, there's a, a little question of int wraparound, um, a slight off by one error. The time began in the 1st of January 1970, which I guess makes me immortal, which is quite nice. Uh, of course, the title of this talk is 1968, but it's close. We can walk from here, OK? It's, so what was happening in 1968? Well, Jimi Hendrix experience was, you know, one of my favourite, uh, one of my favourite uh, uh, guitarists. Jimi Hendrix experience, uh, Axis Boulder's Love, um, uh, Electric Ladyland. These were uh, really kind of rocking the world, and uh, you know, there was, was a hot, the whole flower power era. There was optimism. Uh, the Prague Spring that was then put down. Um, and suppressed by uh, uh, a number of Warsaw Pact countries sending a quarter of a million troops into Prague. This is clearly a time of change. It was the height of the Cold War. Um, so what has actually changed since 1968 to 2018? It turns out that my kids can now also be scared of nuclear war as well, just as I was as I grew up. You know, I think it's nice that I can share that experience with them. <laughs> you know? and in fact, you know, um, I was around in 1968. I wasn't very old. Um, I'm the I'm the little guy there, yeah. So um, you might look and say, "What happened? You used to be so cute." Um, what else was happening in 1968? Star Trek was on TV. Okay. These days, what do we talk about? We're always talking about enterprise systems, ladies and gentlemen. The original enterprise system. One of my favourite films came out. 2001: A Space Odyssey. 1968, that's a year before the moon landings. And it showed a very authentic moon landing. Um, the title sequence uh, uses the Gil Sons font um, and a rather unusual variation decided on by Stanley Kubrick, um, so well, I should be saying typeface really, uh, is that he chose to use O for zero, which gives this very distinctive appearance. Um, this is relevant, by the way, trust me. Uh, because it was also the year, 1968, of the Software Engineering Conference, the famous NATO Software Engineering Conference. And um, this is a, a redone version of the proceedings. Um, they actually, in the, the revised version of the proceedings, they used the Futura font, uh, which is very similar, but it's not the same. And I found a picture of the original cover um, 
and it actually uses the same font as 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I'm, that makes me happy in, in a very simple way. Um, now, a number of people think that Software Engineering Conference, they think that it was this conference that coined the phrase Software Engineering, that the term Software Engineering comes from this conference. No, it doesn't. It comes from this woman here, Margaret Hamilton. Um, she was involved in... So that's, uh, that, that's a mock-up of the command module, uh, an Apollo command module. She was involved in the moon program. See how it all comes together? Moon, the actual moon landing. She was responsible for leading a team which dealt with a lot of the code. And obviously back in the 1960s, people weren't taking software very seriously or they had very naive views about software and its role in large systems. So she, as she said, I began to use the term software engineering to distinguish it from hardware and other kinds of engineering yet treat each type of engineering as part of the overall systems engineering process. She had a very holistic as well as a very technical uh, perspective on all of this. She also created a fault tolerance system that actually allowed people to land on the moon. It turns out that without that fault tolerance um, uh, and without the prioritization mechanisms she put into place, it would not have happened. Now, the funny thing about this is that a number of people, and it has been caricatured many times, um, say, oh, well, this software engineering conference, this was responsible for giving us all of this kind of like plan-driven uh, uh, approach and, you know, everybody managing projects in a very waterfall style. Um, one of those things that I think is worth doing whenever you're going to make a claim is to read the original report. It turns out that's not what they were saying at all. Uh, they were saying many things. There was a great diversity of opinion as to how software development could unfold in the future. Um, but you know what? We have exactly that today. There's no difference. It's, they didn't, did not necessarily speak with one voice. Um, and there are things in that report you look at and go, well, yeah, that's definitely of its time. That's very 1960s, or that's an idea that turns out not to be very effective. But the thing I find most depressing about reading this, and I read it again recently, was how much is in there that we spent the last 50 years rediscovering. So. This guy, Justin Smith, I've only been seven months with the manufacturer and I'm still bemused by the way they attempt to build software. They begin with planning specification, go through functional specifications, implementation specifications, etc., etc. And this activity is represented by a PERT chart with many nodes. He's bemused by this. If you look down the PERT chart, you discover that all the nodes on it up until the last one produced nothing but paper. This is the accusation people say this is what software engineering gave us. No, this is what they were reacting against. As he carefully observes, it is unfortunately true that in my organization, people confuse the menu with the meal. But he was not a lone voice. There are many, I actually had to cut some of the quotes because there are so many where people are going against this, what we consider to be a very conventional plan-driven approach. The most deadly thing in software is the concept which almost universally seems to be followed. In other words, it was already a problem in, one, in many senses. That you are going to specify what you are going to do and then do it. And that is where most of our troubles come from. Yeah, that's a, so in other words, all of those really brilliant ideas we've had over the last couple of decades about this, yeah, not new. This, the whole, you know the word news? The word news is based on the idea that what you are hearing is new. We have had no news for half a century. Again, the design process is an iterative one. Yeah? Wow, radical. It's also, I'm going to point out, not the only time in this document the word iterative is used. And when you go through the document, you see that there are these different strands of thinking that were present then. And there's all kinds of words that you may be surprised to hear. One of the ones I was surprised to, one of the phrases I was surprised to see was unit test. I did not think that that terminology was coined until the 1970s. Certainly, I knew people were writing code-centric tests, but I did not know the term unit test existed. I was surprised by the existence of middleware as a term. People talking about, spending a lot of time talking about modularity and declarative stuff, acceptance testing, and references to Conway's law, or Melvin Conway, uh, which we heard about this morning, and I'm going to cover again, and Christopher Alexander. Christopher Alexander, he is perhaps best known as the guy who came up with design patterns. 
Now, this book was published in 1979 um, and follows two other books in the same series on patterns, which were published in 1975 and 1977. I suspect Christopher Alexander had access to a time machine because this is volume one and was published in 1979. Volume two was published in 1977 and volume three was published in 1975. So, you know, maybe the manuscript fell into a time machine and somebody did reverse collate, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I, I, I found, you know, uh, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham ultimately introduced the concept of patterns into the world of software 1987, 10 years after this. And certainly I've been influenced by that. I co-authored a couple of books, Pattern Origin Software Architecture, um, in terms of this. And patterns are very widely misunderstood. They arrived in software in the late 80s, but really started taking a hold in the 1990s. But there is another question here. We've got the term software architecture. Christopher Alexander is an architect of buildings, real stuff. And just as we need to understand when we are using metaphors to describe the activity, or drawing parallels to describe the activity of software development, does it make sense to use architecture as a metaphor? And I'm gonna say, yeah, I think it does. Because metaphor is not identity and there's a great deal we can learn. In fact, jumping into our time machine, I'm gonna take you back 2,000 years. Um, Vitruvius was a Roman architect and military designer, and uh, he described three qualities of a good structure. He said, it should be firm, firmitas. It should be robust, it should be solid. It should not fall over. You know what? I think that applies to what we do. Utilitas. It shall have utility. It shall be useful. Somebody wants the software. Uh, software development is ultimately a utilitarian endeavor. We do, some of us, we, we might get into it for fun, and we like to enjoy our work, but ultimately there's the idea that somebody wants something from the system. And we may phrase that in terms of requirements, we may talk about that in terms of all kinds of approaches, but ultimately we want it to be useful. That's what characterizes uh, its benefit. But at the same time, we're not flat, shallow people. We have a sense and a soul of aesthetics, venustas. You can decipher that one by realizing the first five letters is Venus, the goddess of beauty. It shall be beautiful. Beauty and code is a very abstract kind of concept, best discussed over beer. But what we're saying there is there should be some quality of aesthetic. There should be something that satisfies you as a user and as a developer. This is another point about architecture. People live inside it. Developers live inside the code base. They, they inhabit it. Does it make them feel happy? Does it make them feel depressed? Yeah. Do, do they feel that they can comfortably work within it. So I, I would make the case that, yeah, this is really old, so this is a little bit further back than 1968. So let's pull ourselves back to this question of patterns. Uh, we have a bit of a problem in the way that many people perceive patterns. A lot of people think, oh, patterns, yes, I know. Our system has singleton all over it. It's like, yeah, you know what, that wasn't what we meant. Now, there is a good singleton. It's up there. That's my singleton. It's a whiskey, it's a single malt. When you sip that gently, the kind of the, that nice warm fire of the highlands rolling around your mouth, you pause, you think, you reflect, and you think, you know, maybe I'm not gonna put that big stupid global variable in the middle of my code after all. <laughs> and lo, your design is improved. Now, that's not really what patterns are about, although I've offered you a useful pattern there. Every time you think you want to add a singleton to your code base, get your team together, get a bottle of scotch, see how you feel afterwards. Um, I got a little frustrated a few years ago with the fact that everybody was coming out with a manifesto. The Agile manifesto is surprisingly well written. It's got a lot of very interesting features about it, uh, one of which is it is written in the continuous present tense. Now, people struggle with the English language, um, and 
English has three present tenses. Most people do not know this. Most people who speak English as a first language are completely unaware of this. You have the regular present, you have um, the uh, continuous present, or the progressive present, and you also have the future present. Yes, that is a real tense. This, the original idea is that this continuous present suggests an activity. I am walking. I have been walking, I am walking at the moment, I will continue to do so. It's got an ongoing sense. So I got a little bit annoyed with the fact that so many people are coming out with um, rather uncreative versions of the Agile Manifesto or patterned after the Agile Manifesto. I said, it's a shame patterns doesn't have this. And I was running a, a workshop, a pattern mining workshop at a company, so I wrote up the Patterns Manifesto. It's very, very short. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by seeing how others have already done it. We are uncovering it, we have done, and we will continue to do so. The whole point about patterns, and re as related directly into our uh, area of concern for this talk, as Brian Foote from the Patterns community noted, patterns are an aggressive disregard of originality. Okay, the whole idea is not that you come up with novel concepts, but you learn from things that people have already done. It turns out we are very poor at this as my readings of the software engineering uh, uh, proceedings uh, demonstrated. And this is kind of interesting because it takes us right the way back to what do we mean by engineering. Glenn Vandenberg, a few years ago, had a very good discussion of the, the notion of software engineering and what it should really mean. And he said, a capsule definition of engineering, independent of any discipline as you're likely to find, the set of practices and techniques that have been determined to work reliably through experience. So therefore, if we are to use this term, we need to look back over our experience. And we need to avoid accidental pitfalls like saying, it's like bridge building. Yeah, maybe. But it turns out that you can normally move a piece of software quite easily. If you look at a bridge and you go, you know what, about 10 meters to the right would have been better. Yeah. Mm. However, there are parallels, you know what, between bridge building and some of the really bad stuff we do in software. I live in Bristol which, uh, if you're not entirely sure where that is, uh, go to London, head west. If you fall into the water, you've gone too far. There you go. That's it. It's just a little bit before that. Um, so, you know, walk back, wet, and there you go. That's Bristol. And um, the, uh, the channel, the part of the Bristol Channel there, is called the Seven. And there is a bridge across it. It's called the Seven Crossing. Recently, well, 15 years ago or so, they built a second bridge. It's called the Second Seven Crossing. So if you think it's just software people who name variables badly, I've got data, now I'm going to have data too, you know what? It's not unique, it's not special, everybody does it. But of course there's this danger of saying, oh yeah, you know what, it, it's, it's like software is like, software engineering, it's, it's like a manufacturing process. Well, it turns out that it's not like a manufacturing process, and this is from the text of um, uh, the document. The replication of multiple copies of a software system is the phase of software manufacture which corresponds to the production phase in other areas of engineering. It is accomplished by simple copying operations and constitutes only a minute fraction of the cost of software manufacture. Again, I thought when I came across this observation in the 1990s, and then again, this century, this was a really new observation until I found it sitting there in the original software engineering document. There is no question, there is no idea that we are the very act of what a programmer does is the manufacturing. The programmer does not produce. We call that copying or compiling. You know, these are your choices. This is a solved problem. There was an explicit recognition back then. However, when I refer to Christopher Alexander, I don't think he did have a time machine. Um, so this talk is about 1968. And so what were they referring to? Because his patterns work would not mature until the 1970s. What he was working on, what Christopher Alexander published in 1964 was a book called Notes on the Synthesis of Form, which predates and prefigures some of the patterns ideas. And there's this whole idea of trying to understand systems in terms of their connection. It turns out that this was the thing that was really influencing 
a number of people, um, notes on the synthesis of form was referenced a number of times in the software engineering proceedings. Um, and Christopher Alexander says, we may therefore picture the process of form making as the action of a series of subsystems. Now he's talking about uh, he's talking about general design and physical design, but it turns out these ideas apply in other disciplines of design. All interlinked, yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. It works because the cycles of correction and recorrection which occur during adaptation are restricted to one subsystem at a time. He might as well have been talking about software. He might as well have been talking about our concerns over coupling and cohesion, why it is that we value um, uh, stable, simple interfaces, why it is that we care about dependency management. This is exactly what people were focused on there. And you know, people got into ha the habit of drawing this kind of diagram. So this is taken from a little paper that often gets referred to, although I wish more people who referred to it would read it. Um, uh, this is uh, How Do Committees Invent by Melvin Conway. The, uh, this was published in 1968 and again was referred to in the software engineering proceedings. The basic thesis is that organisations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organisations. There's an explicit recognition of the social element. There's no idea, there's no assumption here that it's just a technical challenge. In fact, half, I tell you what, half the software engineering proceedings document is focused on how, uh, people problems. Um, we have seen that this fact has important implications for the management of system design. A design effort should be organized according to the need for communication. And again, this one keeps coming up again and again through the following decades. And we weren't really paying attention. Um, even Dijkstra, who's normally associated with a very formal way of thinking about software, had a very explicit view on this. I believe that both the total density of information flow necessary between groups and the percentage of irrelevant information, so he's talking about the quality of communication. I notice a lot of organizations seem to focus on the quantity of communication. You don't need more meetings, really. Uh, that a given group gets can be greatly reduced by effectively structuring the object to be constructed and ensuring that this structure is reflected in the structure of the organization making the product. Uh, Adam noted this uh, in his previous book and also made the observation, this is not just about the initial structure of a system, even though Conway formulated his law around the initial design of a system, the law has important implications for legacy code as well. What do we think of when we think of legacy code? So I'm going to take you back 4,000 years now. It's a hell of a machine I've got. Take you 4,000 years back. Okay, so this is uh, Stonehenge. Uh, this is a photograph I took last year. Um, you can tell that my wife, are, my wife and I are very romantic because I took the. <laughs> this is Valentine's Day, 2017. It's Valentine's Day. It's like, what should we do today? The kids are off school. Tell you what, why don't we go to Stonehenge? You know, forget roses, forget candlelit dinners for two. Let's go and look at big rocks. Even managed to get a picture of a, 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 a raven on it, which is kind of cool. So why am I showing you a picture of this? Because um, these are monoliths from the Greek monolithos, one stone, one big fucking stone, heavy. And we look, and we look at this, and we wonder how did people create this? How did they move this? How did they take these huge great slides? Why did they do this? And that's just on Monday when you go back into work and look at that legacy system. How did people move this? Who created? What are the reasons it was created? They're lost in the midst of time. We have no idea, but it turns out that twice a year our system lines up with the solstice. That's as much as we can do. And every equinox, it works without bugs. It's just like, who knows? The deeper mysteries. Can we move the stones? Oh no, they are sacred and very heavy. The ancients can teach us much. But we say, no, 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 look, software engineering, this is what we want. This is what we want to build. We want structure, we want order. We should arrange, we don't want big stones, little stones. They interact with one another. They have an elegant, sort of aesthetic to it. Uh, let me think, my younger son arranged this when he was about four or five, much to the surprise of me and my wife. Um, he also embodies a slight Japanese aesthetic there, I felt. I thought it was really nice. It's a sort of wabi-sabi kind of approach. 
And this idea of small things. We often talk about you know, cohesive or single responsibility principle and stuff like that. Yet, let's go back to Doug McElroy. Doug McElroy was also at the NATO Software Engineering uh, Summit. And he spoke of the Unix philosophy. Unix was still, uh, still a couple of years away, but not very far on the horizon. This is the Unix philosophy. Write programs that do one thing well, and do, do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. Now, you see, these days, whenever you kind of do this kind of thing, people go, ah, oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about microservices, aren't you, Kevin? If you want to hear that, that's, that's fine by me. Microservices is a really new idea. So, back in 1968, E.E. E. David, define a subset of the system which is small enough to bring to an operational state, then build on that subsystem. To an operational state. He's not simply talking about something that compiles. He's actually saying, let's build this, and this is actually in the context of team organization. The strategy requires that the system be designed in modules which can be realized, tested, and modified independently, apart from the conventions for intermodule communication. Now, I'm not going to say that, oh, it was all microservices back then. It certainly wasn't. But the idea that there's anything new, the only thing that is new with microservices is the idea that we have performance to be able to throw away on it. Why do people want microservices? A function calls too reliable? You know, oh, that function calls too fast. Tell you what, let's, let's communicate. No, no, there are, there are effective reasons. Is that me being cynical? I think it might be. There are effective reasons for doing this. And it's not actually to do with the modularity. This is a, this is either a solved problem or a problem you already have and not going to solve. It's to do with deployment and, uh, and independent, not so much development, but independence of deployment. There are a number of reasons that we value separate processes above and beyond the basic modularity concerns. There's something operational about them that, is, uh, that, is, that may or may not be relevant. But certainly back you know, before this century, the idea that you might want to divide your work up across that many processes was a very good way of saying you're going to waste resources. So people generally did not do it. And unfortunately, our vision of our beautiful microservices generally ends up looking like this. Yeah, so we arranged our rocks and bits of rubble. In fact, that was an observation from Alan Perlis, who was also at the Software Engineering Summit and was the first recipient of the Turing Award. Uh, in the long run, every program becomes Rococo and then rubble. So the idea, you know, this idea that we understand how software evolves is very deeply embedded in our early thinking. In fact, Alan Perlis also gave us a, a rather good observation. Um, a software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of being used after the design. Oh, that's once again 1968 talking. Okay, so you're going to interlace the process of testing and design together. Wow, in a completely non-waterfall way. Or actually, let's be serious. Have you ever seen a waterfall? Do you know how waterfalls work? They work concurrently. Everything is flowing simultaneously. If you ever saw a waterfall that was actually implemented as waterfall development, it would be very strange indeed. Okay, well, here it comes, the next bit of water, and there it goes, all the way down. Now comes the next bit of water. That's not how waterfalls work. They're, they are continuous, they are flow. If anything, they're more like Kanban, okay? So the key point here is that this is all in the flow. We are doing all of these activities concurrently, and they're saying this in spite of the fact that actually trying to get things to work concurrently and get activities to work concurrently is quite difficult. Okay? There's no kind of idea of incremental compilation in the background. Yeah, the, the edit compile cycle can take 24 hours. Yeah? In fact, some people didn't even compile stuff. The, the code that took people to the moon, that was hand compiled. And that's exactly as it sounds artisan crafted code. People would write in Mac, MIT algebraic compiler, they would write in Mac code, and then they would hand it off to other teams who, with translation tables, would manually convert it to assembler. That's software craft. Yeah, it's hand crafted, those are the best op codes. And that's the only way you can guarantee it would be safe. Yeah? These days we have exactly the opposite philosophy. Oh, by the way, people did also check this as well, it turns out. So, 
let's talk about testing. Let's talk about programming languages. Surely, surely we've come on leaps and bounds since then. And you know, how would you have written a unit testing framework back in 1968? So I'm going to use. Um, a language, Algol 68. The clue to the year is in the name. And so at the moment, what we've got here is a procedure called is leap year. You could put spaces, spaces weren't significant in identifiers. It takes one argument, year, and returns the result, bool. Oh, int, bool, that's interesting. And skip, skip simply means that this is a no op operation. Uh, if you know Python, this is like pass. Um, or it's just a, a lonely semicolon in a number of languages. In fact, those keywords, int and bool, that's kind of interesting. So uh, this is uh, my copy of um, the Algol 68 uh, language report. I quite like old books. I quite like, it's quite, okay, it's a bit nerdy, I'm gonna confess it, but I've got copies of certain old books, and uh, so this is one of my more recent acquisitions. Um, and if you look through the keywords, of the language. I'm just going to pick on the ones that turns out uh, these keywords, this is where they came from. They came from Algol 68. It turns out Algol 68 is the most influential language you've either never heard of or never used. It's called int because of Algol 68. Everybody else at the time was calling it integer. God, how, how ordinary. Yeah? And character. No, let's knock it down to char. Long and short came from there. Boolean, whoa, that's too many syllables, man. Knock it back. Unions and structs, oh, void, that's where that came from. So if you're using a language that uses any of these keywords, you're using something that was influenced by Algol 68. So let, let's just tweak that code. I'm going to have it return false. This is a function to classify whether or not a year is a leap year, according to the Gregorian calendar. To be precise, the astronomical calendar. Um, so it's going to yield, it's going to return false. And I'm going to write some tests for it. Now, I'm not saying people did this in 1960. I just want to show you this is how you could write a sensible table-driven approach to uh, 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 unit testing. And I've got a type there called proposition. It's an array. I've got an array of propositions. That's my leap year spec. I've got a string that says years not divisible by four and not leap years. And then I'm passing a little thing in. Void assert not is leap year 1967. What is that thing? That looks like a procedure without a, without a name. It's like a, a freestanding lambda. Hmm. I noticed that people have been getting very excited about their, pra their programming languages now support lambdas. Lambda calculus was invented by Alonzo Church in 1932. So, you know, that's really cool. We're programming like it's the 1930s. Um, and people are getting terribly excited about that. Java, Java people got very excited in 2014 when they finally got lambdas. Like it was, oh, we got this really new thing. And it's just like, yeah. So we're just passing a piece of code. In. Oh, assert, a little, this is where the use of assertions kind of came from. And oh, okay. So uh, let's actually look at what, th what this takes to define such a structure. Well, it's not this high ceremony approach you expect. Uh, the term mode, as in mode of data or mode of access, was used rather than type. So I'm going to define a type called proposition. It's a struct that takes a string and a, uh, a void uh, procedure um, that uh, has no name. Oh, well, that's quite easy. So. Let's build this one up. I'm going to do this in a slightly test-first style. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the tests, so it's going to iterate through that. I'm going to do it in a slightly test-first style. Um, when we get there, this is the framework that I need to run it. Uh, a couple of other things you might want to notice. Um, uh, for do and odd, notice those. If you use born shell and any derivative, that's where this came from. Stephen Bourne um, was massively enamored of the uh, uh, style of Algol, and so therefore created the whole of the Bourne shell based on ideas from Algol 68. Somewhat less brilliantly, though, he also created his C code based on that. In other words, what he did is he macroized, he used the preprocessor to make his C code look like Algol 68. That's one of those things that we generally suggest you do at home, but not at work. Okay. Uh, if you've ever, has anybody ever heard of the 
International Obfuscated C Coding Contest. IOCCC. The IOCCC, uh, the, the contest is quite easy to understand. Well, it's difficult to understand the contributions, but the purpose is quite easy to understand. International Obfuscated C Coding Contest is exactly that. Write really obscure C. That's really clever. That whole contest exists because of the Bourne shell and Stephen Bourne's code. People were inspired to say, well, this is pretty cryptic. I wonder if we can make a competition out of it. Um, so that's, that's where all of this, th this stuff comes from. Um, so let's, let's start adding some more assertions. Years divisible by four, but not by 100 are leap years. So we'll have an example in there, assert that uh, 1968 is not a leap year. So we've got some code there, year mod four equals zero. And then we add the centuries are excluded unless they are on the four century boundary. Now, there's a number of things worth observing here is that in one sense, we, we seem to have an awful lot of uh, round brackets. Um, there is a reason um, for that, uh, because back then, keyboards did not have a standard way of uh, supporting uh, curly brackets and things, and square brackets were used for something else. Um, so square brackets were used for indexing. And so therefore, uh, as you can see there, indicate an array. So the regular round bracket was used for pretty much every kind of grouping. Um, in fact, indeed, still on Scandinavian keyboards, non-Scandinavians still play that game of where the hell are my curly braces? Um, but back then, again, th everybody had this. Uh, now, this might also remind you of another language that has lots of parentheses. Um, another one of my books, uh, the Lisp 1.5 Programs Manual. Um, sometimes people refer to Lisp as a language of the 1950s that was invented around the same time as Fortran. It turns out that's not entirely accurate. Um, Fortran was actually up and running by 1957. The ideas for Lisp were around in the late 1950s, but John McCarthy and his colleagues did not get a working implementation until 1960. So in truth, it's a child of the 1960s. Uh, this manual is one of the most impressive manuals, uh, uh, programming manuals I've ever come across, because it actually tells you how to implement a Lisp machine, because obviously you didn't really have things like um, GitHub and you know, stuff like the internet um, to download stuff on. So every time you bought a book on a programming language, it would typically tell you how to create that language. Um, and so there's a lot of real eye openers here. It's very well written as well. Now, another thing that, so, so this is an idea. And if you, again, if you look through, um, so functional programming. So what were we doing in the 1960s? Um, worrying about uh, nuclear weapons. Um, getting excited about lambdas, doing procedural programming and functional programming. Lisp gets a lot of references in the software engineering uh, 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 proceedings. And there's another aspect to this as well. If we take the ideas a bit further, we realize we can actually go ahead and create, um, I'm going to modify the framework slightly, and actually create a data-driven test arrangement using an almost DSL-like approach. And you can see the DSL-like approach where I'm saying, Years not divisible by four and not leap years with 2018, 2001, 1967, one expect false. Uh, this kind of data driving idea has only really recently crept into um, uh, 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 testing frameworks. Uh, when I say recently, I mean the last two decades. Um, but uh, we could have easily implemented it back then. It's a, it's a very easy way of doing it. And we can also see some other minor changes there. And this is how it would implement uh, or be implemented to run through it. Now, that's, you notice there, if and fee, do and odd. Uh, these are, again, this is more of the uh, uh, born shell stuff. But I'm actually going to pick on a few things here. Um, there are some differences, obviously. Dot notation was not yet, was not considered by Algol 68, but it was used in Algol W and a number of other languages at the time. And there's a few, a few other little bits and pieces. There's this kind of idea of assignment used colon equals rather than, oh, okay, that, that's fine. This is an interesting one, declaring within an if statement. Does anybody use Go? Has anybody used Go, looked at Go, a couple of people? Yeah, I remember when Go programmers got very, very excited about the fact that you could declare variables inside an if statement. Yeah, welcome to our goal 68. Um, plus equals or plus colon equals. If you ever wonder where that came from, Algol 68. Um, the idea that I can pass in and I can use, this is a, the uniformity of the language. 
um, where we see the crossover with Lisp and the ideas of orthogonal language design, the idea is that there is no real difference between a statement and an expression. So if statements yield expressions, so therefore I can there, uh, use an if inside um, uh, any, any uh, context expecting an expression. There is a shorthand form which is perhaps um, less readable, but you know, for people who like that less readability, if it was looking too readable at this point, those of you working in programming languages that use question mark colon, you, know, you may think, oh, I can read this, this is terrible, how do I hide my intent from my colleagues? And yeah, it's fine, Algol 68 offers that one as well. Yeah? Okay, now, obviously, uh, what I've been doing here is, is not what existed in 1968. Um, uh, it's um, the report, the Algol report came out, and they did revise it uh, over the next few years. But more importantly, this is not necessarily how people would have tested, and certainly not the test first approach. If you wanted to see examples of the test first approach, you had to wait till the 1970s. Um, Alfred Aho, um, in an interview talking about ORC, uh, scripting language, well, very elegant scripting language in my view, that exists on a, um, a, in Unix and under every Unix-like system, uh, named for him and the other two developers, uh, Aho, Weinberger, Kernigan, AWK. Uh, they started um, they started doing uh, unit. Uh, they started doing tests for ORC. We instituted a rigorous regression test for all of the features of ORC. Any of the three of us who put in a new feature into the language first had to write a test for the new feature. The whole point is you had to write a failing test and then you added the feature. So yeah, um, obviously this is, doesn't mean everybody was doing it in the 1970s. But if you're looking for the prehistory examples, yeah, it was around. Alan Perlis again making this observation. There is no such thing, question as testing things after the fact with simulation models. But that in effect, the testing and replacement of simulations with the modules, it starts getting a little bit weird here. What's he talking about? That our deeper and more detail goes with the simulation model, controlling, as it were, the place and order in which these things are done. What is it, what is it, what is he talking about? He's describing the work of Brian Randall, one of the editors of the software engineering uh, proceedings. He's describing the work uh, of Brian Randall, which was perhaps better summarized by another guy, Tad Pinkerton. As design work progresses, this simulation will gradually evolve into the real system. The idea is that the bits of the system that do not yet exist, you create a simulation for, a simple simulating piece of code. And then you progressively replace the simulating code with real functionality. If you've ever heard of behavior-driven development or outside in design, welcome to the future. That was the whole idea, the vision of what is the design. It is embodied in your mocks, your stubs, and so on. In other words, you have a practical, empirical basis. So if we're talking mocks and stubs, immediately we're thinking, well, oh, mock objects. What about objects? Well, Simula 67, again, the clue is in the year. Uh, clue of the year is in the number, Six, 1967, uh, Norwegian. Um, 1965 was the first version of Simula, excitingly enough called Simula 1. Um, and their job, what they did is they extended an earlier version of Algol with features that would allow you to simulate the real world, like have objects in it. That was their intention. Simula was known to a number of people at the time, and uh, certainly the people at this conference, they refer to it in many cases, and they also refer to it as having many of the characteristics that they think are desirable but object-oriented programming did not go mainstream um, until uh, about three decades later. Um, so that's this kind of question. So brilliant, that's fine. But why am I showing you a book called Structured Programming? Because people, when they talk about object-oriented programming, they say, oh, well, object-oriented programming, it came along, it displaced structured programming, which was the organizing principle for procedural programming. These are different paradigms. Yeah, when we think of structured programming, it's all about block structure, it's about procedures. And indeed, uh, uh, Tony Hall with Uli Johan Dahl observed one of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. So what's this got to do with objects? Well, a slight variation. A procedure which is capable of giving rise to block instances which survive its call will be known as a class, and the instances will be known as objects of that class. Oh. It turns out that in this section, hierarchical program structures of that book, most of which, it was, the book was published in the early 70s, but most of the book is based on essays that were published in the 1960s onwards. 
as far as they were concerned, objects were structured programming, because they weren't not structured. They were very structured indeed. It just turns out that it's surprisingly hard to simulate this in languages like Fortran. So everybody forgot, as it were, that it went into a deep sleep of about 20 years, that actually structured programming included the concepts of structuring uh, in terms of data abstraction. Now, when most people think about structured programming, they think, ah, structured programming, that is all about one thing. Not doing this. Do not use the go-to. <sighs> yeah. That's not really what structured programming is about. It's kind of like a side effect. Um, but nonetheless, people associate it in their mind, and they, they associate it very much, here we go, 1968, with this letter from Dijkstra to communications of the ACM, go-to statement considered harmful. And this is the first published instance of something considered harmful. Then everybody else did something considered harmful. So, in the introduction, as mentioned, I quite like words. And every Friday, I, I run this thing called Word Friday, a uh, Facebook page, I normally post an unusual, I post an unusual word and its definition. And uh, a few years ago, I came across the word snow clone, which has nothing to do with the weather outside. Clichéd wording used as a template, typically originating in a single quote, such as X considered harmful. These aren't the X's you're looking for. X is the new Y. It's X, but not as we know it. No X left behind. It's X is all the way down. All your X are belong to us. In other words, every single one of these is generally, if you go out onto the web, somebody's written a blog with a variation of one of these titles. These are all patterned after. They are snow clones of the original. And go-to statement considered harmful is the originator of the considered harmful snow clone. But is that what Dijkstra actually said? Yeah, you know, that whole thing about history and going back and looking at the detail. It turns out it's not. His original letter was written with a case against the go-to statement, a slightly more modest wording. Go-to statement considered harmful is clickbait, 1968 style. It was actually... The, the title was changed by the editor, the then editor of that issue of the communications of the ACM, who was Nicholas Wirt, who invented Pascal and Modular 2. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a clickbait inside every Swiss uh, computer scientist. So, this tech gets us thinking about top down programming. I said, oh, maybe we should do top down programming. This is the way to define everything. Even while people were advocating it, they were saying, well, oh, steady on. Be careful, you know, it's not all this Alan Perlis. Everything should be built top down except the first time. Or more accurately from Tony Hall, you cannot teach beginners top down programming because they don't know which, way, which end is up. There's this idea that it's a massively brilliant way of describing something, but actually to refine it requires an iterative understanding. You cannot get there first time and say, I'm going to, in fact, there's, there's a, a quite a few pages dedicated to the dichotomy of bottom-up versus top-down programming um, in the uh, uh, software engineering proceedings. But that takes us right back to the ideas of structured programming and object orientation, and why it is that that section of the book in structured programming is called hierarchical program, uh, uh, program structures concept hierarchies, what we would now call inheritance hierarchies. The construction principle involved is best called abstraction. We concentrate on features common to many phenomena and we abstract away many features, to, uh, uh, many away features too far removed from the conceptual level at which we are working. Again, we have this problem that many people who thought inheritance had originally been just introduced as a code reuse mechanism, no, it wasn't. It was originally as a conceptual organizational model. And this led in the 1970s, the early 70s, so 1974, Barbara Liskoff, uh, another Turing Award winner, I think she got it in 2009, she advocated programming with abstract data types. That was an idea that had been just emerging from the early 70s onwards. An abstract data type defines a class of abstract objects which are completely characterized by the operations available in those objects. Again, if any of this sounds familiar, except in your code base, then it's old. And this is the problem. This is not new. Oh, yeah, wouldn't it be a great idea if we didn't make all our data public? Oh, no, it's fine. All our data is totally private, but we have getters for every single thing. Yeah, you know, that's still kind of public. So there's this idea of don't overpublish the representation. A programmer is concerned only with the behavior which that object exhibits, but not with any details of that behavior. 
and how it's achieved by an implementation. Really a very strict view of what, of what we refer to as encapsulation. And that idea, again, nothing here is new. This was advocated. We are very poor at understanding where some of these ideas come from and the fact that people were already experiencing those problems. And this is the key thing, is we were already trying to find the solutions to most of the technical problems, as well as the people problems, we've seen that, that we have now. And everybody's kind of surprised that we haven't solved them. It, all that's happened is they've just become amplified. David Parnas, in organising, talking about modularity. I spoke to somebody a couple of years ago, uh, yeah, somebody who probably uh, who, who knows a few things about this stuff, and he said, oh yes, Parnas invented modularity. And he, no, he didn't. He just invented a way of thinking about it. Modularity was present in the 1960s. This is early 70s again, 1972. We propose one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. The idea of looking at the instability of your code and not simply organising according to data types is also present. The idea that perhaps you organise your program structuring, your modules, your layers and everything else like that according to instability and uncertainty. Uh, one of the things I, I, I love was talking to somebody who was saying, oh, well, yeah, yeah, no, our code, yeah, we use, we use C-sharp like this, we do this, that and the other. Nothing is really obvious about this, about this code base. Um, we keep everything encapsulated, and this was at a point when ASP was quite popular, and then you looked at the web pages produced from this system, and they were all suffixed with .asp. Encapsulation means you don't publish your internal implementation, including in URLs. Most systems leak implementation details. They do not respect this or understand its consequences. So it's kind of funny when you have to rewrite one of those system in, systems in Ruby on Rails. You've now got a whole load of legacy mappings to deal with that are all .asp. So as we are strolling through the 1970s, we've dotted around 1972, 1974, I, I was directed to a rather good talk by Brett Victor on the future of programming. And this talk was in 2013 and he gave the talk as if he were giving the talk from 40 years earlier in 1973. So he came on just wearing a white shirt and very sort of regular pair of trousers and uh, uh, lots of pens, lots of pens. And so he talked about many of the challenges that we might encounter in the future and the really interesting ideas that have been discussed in the 1960s. Um, and he was coming at a completely different angle. I only came across that after uh, I, I thought about this talk. So it's fascinating to then sit and watch the talk. And he goes a little bit further. He starts talking very much about concurrency and the challenges of concurrency at one point. He talks about different programming models um, for this. And then it, there's this lovely quote. He said, yeah, threads and locks, they're kind of a dead end, right? You know, this, if you go back to the early 70s, go back to the late 60s, everybody was very interested in locking uh, primitives. Algol 68 actually had a threading model built in. But its idea of locking was based on semaphores, which are kind of like the precursors of what we call mutexes now. But that was not, that's not really satisfying. People weren't satisfied at the time. And there were other models being proposed at the time for how we should organize concurrency. One of them, for example, is an obscure little model called the actor model, which took its time to get into the public uh, awareness. But that was 1973, Carl Hewitt. But his observation is key. Threads and locks, they're a dead end. They are a terrible way to program a system. And he said, yeah, I think if we're still using threads and locks 40 years from now. We should just like pack up and go home because we've clearly failed as an engineering field. We're five years on from that and still people are doing this stuff. And you think, oh, well, you know, maybe not everybody knew about this. Yeah, let me, let me start giving some of the closing credit to, again, back to Doug McElroy. This is a memo of his from 1964. So I'm going to flip-flop from 1973-74 back to uh, 1964. We should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hoses. Screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. This is the way of I.O. also. He's talking about creating a pipeline. He's talking about data flow architectures. One of the classic, simplest, purest compositional approaches um, uh, that you can find. Again, a functional approach. He's talking about this. It took them six years to find the pipe symbol on the keyboard, though. 
But this is his vision, separate processes, do one job, all of this stuff, not a single one of these ideas is new. And sometimes people say, well, the problem is that software is a young field. No, it isn't. It's actually older than quite a lot of the things that people do. I do not recognize half the jobs that exist now. It's not, it's not a question of age. Software development can only be considered immature because of how we use our experience, not because we lack experience. Software runs the planet. There are millions of developers and have been millions of developers over the last half century. The ideas they were talking about in 1968 were already considered old. The problems that they were talking about were problems they had identified in the 50s and were still wrestling with. It's not a question of age, it's a question of what we do as a response. Um, so, if we're going to try and figure out the future, then perhaps look around, because it turns out the answer's probably already there. Borrowing from William Gibson, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. All of the things that we are getting excited about, well, you know, I, I've given talks, uh, uh, you know, I get excited about programming languages. I don't want to diss programming languages. I get very excited about features and stuff like that. But there's also a part of me that recognizes there is nothing new here. Every single programming language I see is at one level disappointing. It's exciting in one sense, but it's always disappointing. It's like, yeah, I see where that idea came from. Or that's an idea I didn't know about. Oh, you know what? That idea is 30 years old. That idea is 25 years old. If you look around, the future is around you, you just don't know what it looks like yet. That's the thing to be aware of. See what has already happened, see what is happening. And perhaps I won't be in a position where in 2028, I'm giving a talk called 1978. Thank you very much. <laughs>